Hello everyone. Today we will discuss how cells reproduce. This happens via a complex series of events termed the cell cycle that we will discuss in this lecture. As you know, cells have a very complex organization. Cells have got DNA, the genetic material that must be inherited accurately and also several other components such as various organelles including some organelles such as mitochondria that also have their own genetic material. So how do cells reproduce? Obviously this would involve the duplication of all the constituents, uh, their segregation and the division of the cell into daughter cells. So shown here is the cell cycle. Uh, so the process of cell division occurs when cells go through this cell cycle. It consists of four phases shown here is the mitotic cell cycle that is the equational division where the daughter cells inherit uh, one copy of the original genome of the mother cell. So um, the phases of the cell cycle are shown here. Uh, there is G1, S, G2 and M uh, and uh, the one of the important events occurs during S phase and that is uh, DNA synthesis or DNA replication. Uh, the process of segregation of the genetic material into two equal parts uh, occurs during this process of uh, mitosis or M phase shown here. There are also two gap phases G1 and G2 which are uh, phases where the cell prepares for uh, the next phase for the process of division and these are also uh, highly regulated phases. For example G1 it is uh, usually the longest phase and uh, sometimes the cells they can enter into a non-dividing state uh, known as G0 uh, when uh, the conditions are not favorable and when favorable conditions arise those cells may again re-enter the cell cycle. Um, then there is another gap phase between S and M phases named, known as G2 phase and uh, this is also a growth phase. Um, the, sometimes the cells grows in size and it prepares for the complex process of uh, mitosis coming up. Early biologists used simple light microscopy and they could uh, observe chromosomes inside cells and with those simple tools they could also depict and draw the various stages of mitosis that were fairly accurate which is shown here from uh, the atlas of histology. In fact such observations coupled with the knowledge of genetics and the laws of inheritance that we discussed earlier led to the germ plasm theory of heredity according to which uh, the hereditary information resides in the germ plasm or chromosomes which are these thread like structures that appeared uh, in cells as they were uh, about to divide. And these thread like structures it was observed appear to be more or less equally segregated between uh, the two cells that were produced by cell division. So it was thought that uh, most likely the genetic information might be in these entities, the chromosomes, or it was this part of the cell was referred to as the germplasm. So mitosis was first observed by microscopists and it was appreciated as a very dramatic event that the cell goes through. I mean a cell that was just lying there seemingly doing nothing suddenly would get activated, a lot of changes occurred within the cells, these uh, magical uh, thread-like structures known as chromosomes uh, seem to appear out of nowhere and uh, they underwent division and one could also see 
the formation of a structure known as a spindle that helped in segregating these chromosomes. So um, this process uh, of chromosome segregation was being studied even before the structure of DNA had been discovered. And uh, of course, interphase was considered to be uneventful and somewhat uninteresting because nothing seemed to be happening there. However, in science, technological advances lead to new discoveries and uh, labeling studies became possible uh, when people started, biologists started using radioisotopes. And uh, by such studies, when labeling studies uh, were done uh, using tritiated thymidine and precise measurements of changes in the DNA content was done, S phase was discovered. So uh, it was found that uh, there is a period of DNA synthesis which occurred only within a limited period of the cell cycle. So uh, this phase was within interphase and this led to what we now understand as the four phases of the cell cycle. G1 that is from birth to S S or synthesis phase where DNA is synthesized, G2 that is the end of S to M or gap 2 and mitosis. So with the discovery of S phase, uh, we have become familiar with these four phases in the cell cycle and the image on the right uh, or rather the diagram on the right shows a field of cells in which uh, they are in different stages and one of them is in S phase as is depicted here by incorporation of BRDU that is bromodeoxyuridine which is a thymidine analog that is incorporated specifically into DNA and this has been hybrid, uh, visualized by hybridizing with anti-BRDU antibodies that are labeled. And a similar experiment can also be done using tritiated thymidine and incorporation of which also indicates that these cells are undergoing DNA synthesis and therefore they are in S phase. On the left is shown uh, a panel where there are cells in different stages of mitotic division. At the top is interphase where there's not much structure. The cell is uh, more or less flattened and the uh, DNA is uh, not uh, somewhat amorphous to look at and uh, then you can see entry into prophase the chromosomes start forming these thread like structures and this is followed uh, by metaphase when the chromosomes have congregated in one plane in the center the metaphase to anaphase transition where they are separated uh, the se replicated chromosomes or sister chromatids are segregated from each other and finally telophase when the DNA masses move away from each other at the ends of the cells. So um, of course uh, there's also the G1 and G2 gap phases uh, which are shown in this diagram of the cell cycle again and this uh, G1 phase is very important its, its length can actually vary depending on the external conditions and uh, when it is unfavorable as I mentioned the cells they delay progression through this phase and they wait for the favorable conditions and sometimes uh, they may even exit out of it and enter a specialized resting stage known as G0 and uh, some cells in fact in multicellular organisms remain in such a stage for days, weeks or even years before they will resume the process of cell division. And uh, in fact, many cells remain in G0 permanently till they die or the organism uh, completes its life. And uh, when the extracellular conditions become favorable, then uh, the cells in early G1 or G0, they actually start progressing in the cell cycle and uh, they progress through a very critical point known as the commitment point which is located here at the end of G1 
which is also referred to as start in budding yeast that we will be talking about. Uh, and it's also uh, known as the restriction point in mammalian cells. So after the cells pass that particular point in late G1, then the cells are committed to DNA replication. Even if the signals that were stimulating their growth and division are removed or they are no longer there or conditions become unfavorable, once they've crossed this point, then the cells are committed to divide. So uh, in these gap phases, basically the cells are preparing for division. And um, the length of the cell cycle, of course, varies. The duration varies depending on the type of cell. For example, in a human cell in culture, uh, the cells may take about 24 hours to divide. And interphase occupies most of that period. And M phase is relatively short. Uh, it may take about an hour. And in contrast, um, microbes such as the budding yeast uh, Saccharomyces cerevisiae that we'll be discussing, uh, the entire cell, mitotic cell cycle is completed within two hours. So uh, shown here are dividing fibroblasts it's an asynchronous culture of these fibroblasts in a culture dish. And here actin is labeled in green and DNA is labeled in red. And what you can see, in fact, in this field of cells is two of the cells are in mitosis. And you can see the condensed masses. They have actually undergone anaphase. And they're in two different stages of anaphase. And another interesting thing to note is that the cells, they look different from the other cells. The other cells are somewhat flattened and well attached to the culture dish, whereas these cells are somewhat rounded up. And that is a characteristic feature of cells which are undergoing uh, mitosis. And in fact, uh, sometimes by shaking the culture dish, one can get these cells to release more readily and thereby collect cells which might be in mitosis as opposed to interphase. Here we can see different stages of cell division in human cells. Uh, the DNA is shown in red and uh, tubulin is shown in green, which forms microtubules. So here's an interphase cell which is reasonably flattened out and uh, the DNA seems to be somewhat disorganized and it progresses to early prophase where some structure appears in the DNA. You can still see a single uh, centrosome which has not yet separated into two. And this is followed by late prophase. Now the two centrosomes have separated and you can start seeing more of DNA condensation happening. Uh, here's prometaphase uh, which is a phase where the DNA has condensed and the chromosome and microtubules are forming associations, but this process of a chromosome attachment is still incomplete. Uh, in metaphase, all the chromosomes have aligned in one plane and uh, they are all also attached to microtubules in a bipolar fashion. That is each pair of sister chromatids uh, has attached to a microtubule coming from the opposite pole. When all the chromosomes are attached, the metaphase to anaphase transition occurs. And in this step, all the pairs of sister chromatids split apart from each other, each other and they move away from each other. That is, they start segregating. So you see chromosome separation happening in anaphase, which also has two phases, anaphase A and B. The first where the chromosomes separate and the second uh, which involves elongation of the spindle. This progresses to telophase where the chromosomes have completely segregated and reached the poles. And uh, now the cells, they start to flatten out. There is also decondensation of the chromatin happening. And here you see early cytokinesis where the chromosomes are decondensed and the nuclear envelope has been reformed. 
and uh, finally late cytokinesis where the cells not only have separated but they have also moved apart so one important step which i mentioned but it is not shown here is the process of nuclear envelope breakdown which happens uh, somewhere around here when the cell first enters mitosis and uh, in this process the nuclear envelope breaks down and therefore the chromatin is released and it can actually spread out and the chromosomes can bind microtubules so microtubules and chromosomes find each other and make the associations which are required ultimately uh, for the process of segregation and of course once again the nuclear envelope is reformed at the end after the chromosomes have segregated to give rise to a normal cell which has a nucleus so here is a time lapse of the process of mitosis contributed by Drew Berry and Etsuka Uno and this was made by Jeremy Pickett Heaps in this video you can see the process of chromosome condensation you can see metaphase now here all the chromosomes at the equatorial plane you can see the metaphase to anaphase transition that just happened the chromosomes moving apart now uh, the cells are in telophase and you can see decondensation of the chromosome cytokinesis has occurred you have two cells now from the original uh, cell so this is a very fascinating event to watch and no wonder a lot of people were interested in studying this process and understanding how it is regulated. So scientists watched this dramatic event of mitosis for a long time, but they had no idea what was controlling these events. Uh, it wasn't even clear whether there was a system for controlling or whether all these processes they somehow control themselves and they were pre-programmed to occur in a particular order so scientists wondered whether there is this inbuilt time dependent program by which these events occur or could it be that this complex process is subjected to some kind of regulation and uh, whether or not there is regulation was something everybody was wondering about. But evidence for regulation came from two classic experiments that I will be discussing in today's lecture. Uh, the first of them is shown here. This is an experiment done by Johnson and Rao. Long time ago, in fact, it's a very interesting experiment where they carried out cell fusion. Okay, so they fused cells uh, which were in S phase with G1 phase cells. So there are two, three sets of experiments here and to get a conclusion, you have to do all three of them. So um, when they observed that when S phase cells were fused with a G1 phase cell, then um, as you know, S phase cells are undergoing DNA replication, which can be uh, assayed by the assays I described earlier. So they observed that after the fusion, the G1 nucleus entered S phase immediately. And of course, the S phase nucleus continued its DNA replication. But the G1 nucleus sort of prematurely, after the fusion, started uh, replicating its DNA. So uh, this indicated that the S phase cell induced premature DNA synthesis in G1. On the other hand, when they fused S phase cells with the G2 phase cells. The S phase nucleus, of course, kept on replicating its DNA, but the G2 uh, nucleus was unaffected. That is, it did not enter S phase unlike the G1 nucleus. When they fused G1 cells with G2 cells, the G2 stayed in G2 and the G1 nucleus entered into S phase as per its own timetable as in it would have entered S phase at some point anyway so it maintained that timetable it did not prematurely enter S phase so these experiments although simple they led to some very interesting insights into regulation one that the S phase cell can induce premature DNA synthesis in G1 indicating that there is 
some kind of replication promoting factor in S phase cells. However, the S phase cell could not induce DNA synthesis in G2 cells even though it has this factor. So this indicated that there is a re-replication block in uh, G2 nuclei. So even if you provide the S phase uh, cell contents or the factor present in S phase cell that induces replication, uh, this is resistant to it. It will not enter the process of DNA replication. So this was very interesting. It indicated for the first time that there is some regulation going on. And also at around the same time, another evidence for regulation of the cell cycle came from experiments that were done with uh, Xenopus oocytes. So Xenopus oocytes, or it's a type of a frog, and uh, these are very large cells. And there you can actually see them with the naked eye. The diameter might be one millimeter or so. And they are very enriched and they've stored up lots of macromolecules and they are sort of poised for entering into cell division immediately after fertilization. So they provide a very rich source of uh, various macromolecules which may be required for cell division. And also they are very suitable for experiments on uh, cell cycle. So shown here is a process of oocyte maturation and activation. So normally an oocyte is arrested in the G2 phase of meiosis 1. Meiosis is a type of reductional cell division um, and it is important in the formation of germ cells and we'll be discussing that in detail later on. So in this stage in the G2 phase of meiosis the cell awaits a hormonal trigger such as progesterone to enter into the M phase of meiosis 1. So in the absence of such a signal, it remains arrested in the G2 phase. When the appropriate hormonal trigger is available, then it enters into the M phase of meiosis 1 and it undergoes meiosis 1 and then it is arrested in the M phase of meiosis 2 until fertilization um, and um, of course during this first division there's a polar body which is extruded and um, after fertilization occurs uh, this of course results in formation of the zygote and it results in a rapid sequence of cell divisions which are known as cleavage divisions because here the cell does not grow in size. The cell was already a large cell uh, with a lot of content. And without growing, uh, it undergoes uh, periodic rapid divisions to produce an embryo, which has uh, thousands of smaller cells. And then it undergoes, of course, the process uh, of embryogenesis and development into the adult. So we are not concerned with that part here. All right, so using this system, uh, the scientists, uh, Matthew and Mark Kurt, uh, performed an experiment trying to test whether there are regulatory factors present in mature oocytes. And uh, one thing to remember is that because of the large size of this cell, it can be micro-injected with various test substances by experimentalists. And uh, what they did is they injected the cytoplasm from the M phase oocyte into the G2 phase oocyte, you know, which was normally resting. And what they observed is, as soon as they did this, this G2 phase oocyte could uh, enter into M phase, that is, it was driven into M phase, which it normally does upon a hormonal uh, trigger. So now uh, it could enter M phase without hormonal stimulation. So that was interesting. And at the same time, um, 
they also did some control experiments where they injected cytoplasm uh, from interface cell and when they did that uh, nothing really happened the oocyte remained in g2 phase it was not driven into mitosis and this is an important control because it shows that not, it's not just the process of injection you know it's a big disturbance to a cell to poke a hole into it and uh, inject uh, some more liquid so this e control experiment shows that just going through this process is not something that signals and triggers uh, entry into m phase so that's important to know therefore this experiment uh, implied that there must be something in the cytoplasm of m cells that was driving uh, the g2 cell to enter into m and hence they concluded that there is a cytoplasmic regulator mpf uh, which stands for maturation promoting factor and is also now referred to as mitosis promoting factor which controls the entry into mitosis so there is this unknown important regulator mpf present in the cytoplasm of m phase cells which can induce g2 cells to enter into mitosis so uh, a major breakthrough in trying to understand uh, the molecules that regulate the cell cycle uh, came with the identification of a key regulator of the cell cycle control system now um, this discovery was actually made by three uh, groups led by the scientists lee hartwell uh, paul nurse and tim hunt and it's a very significant discovery the discovery of this master regulator the cdk cyclin complex cdk stands for cyclin dependent kinase and uh, this discovery uh, was rewarded with the nobel prize in physiology and medicine uh, to the scientists mentioned here uh, dr hartwell paul nurse and tim hunt all right so how was this done lee hartwell was a uh, he was working with budding yeast so he is a yeast geneticist and uh, he used budding yeast as a model system to uh, sort of address or investigate the question of cell cycle regulation now uh, yeast are small single celled fungi and um, they are eukaryotes as discussed in the earlier lectures and the budding yeast which was the experimental system in the hartwell lab is uh, commonly known as baker's yeast and also used by brewers and it's this uh, oval cell okay and it uh, actually divides by budding it gives off a bud and therefore it's known as budding yeast and uh, the way it uh, divides is gives off a small bud which grows in size and uh, this bud appears during g1 and then it keeps on growing in size and then finally it separates from the mother cell um, so the original cell is termed as the mother cell and the new cell which Uh, during the process of division of cell is still a little smaller than the mother cell is referred to as the daughter cell so uh, these uh, organisms they reproduce very rapidly uh, i already mentioned within 2 hours you can have a complete uh, doubling and their genome size of course is smaller than that of um, mammalian cells and uh, they are also uh, they were great favorites of molecular geneticists because they were amenable to genetic manipulations you could uh, actually uh, not only isolate mutants but you could create mutations by deleting genes or replacing or altering them because uh, the process of homologous recombination in this organism 
uh, happened at a higher frequency than some of the other systems. And uh, another interesting thing about the budding yeast is that uh, they have uh, also a haploid state. So they can exist in both haploid and diploid stages. And in the haploid stage, they have only a single copy of each gene. So uh, this is important because uh, when you isolate mutations uh, that inactivate a gene, then you can even study the recessive ones. Uh, because uh, the, the problem of the second copy of the gene in the cell is not there. And uh, so uh, this was a good system to study uh, cell cycle regulation. And certainly uh, Dr. Hartwell's lab decided to address uh, this question. And the way they went about is, it is that it is expected that, you know, if there's a mutant which cannot complete the cell cycle, then it will not grow. So they made use of what is known as conditional mutants. Uh, that is, there are mutants whose mutant phenotype is evident only under certain conditions, but not other conditions. And uh, one of the most uh, popular type of conditional mutant are temperature sensitive mutants. So these are mutants which at some normal temperature, referred to as a permissive temperature, they grow just fine but at a higher temperature known as the non-permissive or the restrictive temperature, their mutant phenotype is expressed and they would arrest. So uh, th these type of mutants are more suitable for studying such important genes that are required for cell division or also genes which are essential for viability of a cell. So, um, so these cells, um, they, they took these cells and uh, they did a screen for mutants. And uh, what they were looking for was uh, some phenotype which would indicate that the cell uh, has some defect in the cell cycle. So shown here is a field of uh, budding yeast cells showing the actual morphologies of different types of cells. So you may have an original uh, single cell without a bud, uh, which is um, in very early G1. And you start seeing small buds appear that grow in size and then they grow bigger and ultimately they get separated into mother and daughter cells, as I already mentioned. And it is also shown in this uh, cell cycle uh, over here, where you can see the shapes of the budding yeast cells in relation to the stage of the cell cycle that they are in. So this was an important feature of budding is just by looking at the cells uh, by light microscopy, you could actually have some indication uh, what stage of the cell cycle they were in. And uh, of course, uh, what we'll also be discussing is that these studies, they led to uh, the definition of an important stage um, or point in late G1 um, in the cell cycle, which is referred to as start. And I already made a reference to it, but this is a point in late G1, uh, which is critical. If a cell crosses that, then it is committed for DNA replication. So shown here is the life cycle of yeast, budding yeast. So yeast exists in uh, two mating types, A and alpha, that is two different genders, if you will. And uh, these are the haploid forms and they can grow happily undergoing mitosis when conditions are optimal for their growth or conditions are suitable for their growth. And uh, these, uh, each of these, they actually secrete uh, a pheromone. So an A cell secretes an A pheromone and an alpha cell secretes an alpha pheromone, uh, which uh, can uh, actually attract the cell of the opposite mating type and cause fusion. So when an A cell and alpha cell are in proximity, uh, they can sense the direction from where the pheromone signal is coming and they form this protuberance uh, known as a shmoo. 
and eventually they would fuse with each other the process also referred to as um, mating uh, or conjugation and uh, they form a diploid and the diploid now can also survive so there is cell fusion as well as nuclear fusion and uh, it can also undergo mitotic divisions under suitable uh, conditions uh, however if it encounters unfavorable conditions or starvation for example and you can induce um, this in the lab also then uh, the diploid can undergo meiosis or sporulation and give rise to tetrads of spores each tetrad has two a and two alpha spores and these can germinate to uh, produce the respective haploid forms a or alpha haploid yeast strains so uh, one can take advantage of this life cycle and normally when people do a screen it is advantageous to do the screen for mutants in both an a and alpha populations because eventually one when you get a collection of mutants then you can mate them and assign the mutants into different complementation groups to perform a mutant screen first cells are mutagenized using a mutagen such as EMS that results in base substitution mutations in DNA and uh, one usually mutagenizes both A and alpha cell populations and uh, then you screen or select for your desired phenotype uh, and this is known as a primary screen and this is followed by screening for uh, the specific phenotype affecting the process you are interested in uh, using an assay which is designed for this purpose and this is known as a secondary screen uh, the various mutants that are obtained are then crossed that is the A mutants are crossed with the alpha mutants to assign complementation groups and uh, this actually indicates the number of genes uh, that might have got mutated that are affecting the process that you are studying and finally you can identify the genes defective in those mutants by complementation from a gene expression library and in case of budding yeast because the genes have uh, very few of them have introns we can use a genomic DNA library but uh, usually it's good to use a cDNA expression library so uh, in this case for the cell division cycle mutant screen the primary screen uh, was temperature sensitivity uh, which is uh, basically uh, making a collection a large number of mutants which were temperature sensitive were collected and then they were screened by microscopy which is a secondary screen to look for cell cycle arrest phenotype uh, with the expectation that the mutants which are arrested showing a uniform cell cycle arrest phenotype that is an arrest in a particular phase of the cell cycle uh, those may be defective in uh, factors which are important for cell cycle control or cell cycle regulation so by doing this uh, the Hartwell lab they identified a large number of uh, cell division cycle mutants uh, which are abbreviated as CDC mutants so shown in this panel is a field of asynchronous wild type cells this is a diagram and uh, you can see different types of cells here's a cell with a very tiny bud a larger bud here's a cell which has duplicated its DNA but the DNA has not yet uh, been divided and uh, here's a cell which is just entered the process of division you can see a bilobe nucleus that is uh, uh, it's about to divide it's in the process and uh, here's another where it's in telophase the uh, two DNA masses have segregated away from each other yet they are still connected by a little uh, strand of chromatin so the process of division is not yet complete here the nuclear division is complete but the cells are still attached so uh, in an asynchronous population you can see all of this 
Uh, in the CDC mutants, of course, I told you there are a large number of mutants that were discovered. I am just showing uh, the phenotypes of a few of them. So the first one is a very important mutant that we will be talking about a lot in today's lecture, termed CDC28. And the phenotype it shows is a, sort of like a early G1 phenotype with a single cell which has got a single DNA mass which is uh, haploid, uh, 1N. It has one copy of the DNA. And uh, two other mutants are also shown, CDC14, uh, which uh, looks like it has got a telophase-like arrest, uh, but the process of segregation is not fully completed. Uh, there's still some strand connecting the two DNA masses. And of course, cytokinesis has not occurred. And CDC15, which is more or less similar to CDC14, but it is a little uh, further along. Uh, in, in that the DNA masses in most of the cells appear to be completely separated while in few of them you may see a strand connecting the two and it has not uh, yet undergone the cell division or cytokinesis. When the screen was envisaged, the scientists wondered what might they find from such a study. Uh, it's possible to predict you know, what you might find uh, from such type of experiments. And uh, they thought uh, most likely that they would find genes falling into various functional categories, such as most importantly, of course, controls which are responsible for progress of the cell cycle. Processes that are monitored by checkpoints, which are regulatory pathways in cells, uh, which check whether everything is proper for the cell to progress forward in the cell cycle. And we'll discuss more about these pathways later on in the course. Uh, they also thought that maybe they might find genes involved in signaling pathways that cause arrest in response to external signals. And also uh, those which are involved in morphogenetic steps of the cell cycle. That is, even though these genes are not regulatory, they are important for certain morphogenetic step. And if it doesn't occur, then you might get a cell cycle arrest. So uh, let's discuss CDC28. They found this mutant CDC28, which has the arrest phenotype shown here. Uh, it has an early G1 like arrest phenotype with an unreplicated uh, genome. And uh, they found actually uh, with using uh, certain experiments involving cell cycle synchronization using alpha factor, alpha factor can arrest cells uh, in a G1 like state. And uh, they found that in this case, G1 arrested CDC28 cells uh, would block progress at start. That is a certain point in the cell cycle when they were released from the G1 arrest at the restrictive temperature. So uh, when they were blocked at this stage, uh, they could still conjugate or mate with each other. And also these cells, they uh, did not initiate DNA synthesis. So now we know that CDC28 encodes uh, a cyclin dependent kinase. So another group led by Paul Nurse was also interested in this question and they used the fission yeast, which is another type of yeast, different from budding yeast, to also obtain a collection of CDC mutants. Now the difference between budding yeast and fission yeast of course is that fission yeast divides by fission and not by budding. And um, there is a septum formation between uh, when the cells are about to divide and the division is equal that is the two cells which are formed after the process of cell division they are equal in size and also an important distinction is that the g2 phase in the fission yeast life cycle is much longer whereas in budding is the g2 phase is somewhat indistinct actually it is not well defined um, but in this case after S phase, the cell actually elongates in size. 
till it, re it reaches almost the size which is required uh, at the time of cell division to give rise to two equal size cells which are of the same size as the original uh, mother cell. So Paul Nurse's lab made collections of CDC mutants of the fissionese Schizosaccharomyces pombi. And here are examples of some of the phenotypes that they saw. So again, in this case, by looking at the length of the cell and whether or not it has a septum, you can get a pretty good idea what stage of the cell cycle it is in. And uh, for example, here is a cell which has duplicated its DNA and it has elongated, but it has not yet divided. And here's a cell which has just divided into uh, the two uh, daughter cells and so on in the wild type or normal cell population. So they found some interesting classes of mutations. So one of one class was this one where uh, it is uh, one of the main mutants we'll be discussing in this category is CDC2 and CDC25. So uh, this particular mutant phenotype was that the cell was highly elongated, but division did not happen. Duplication of DNA had happened, but it was not undergoing the mitotic division. So there's some sort of block in mitosis. And another very interesting category that they observed were these tiny cells. And uh, one of these mutants uh, was referred to as V1. Uh, which is a Scottish term for tiny or small. So the V1 mutant is, uh, undergoes division perhaps more rapidly than it should. Uh, it divides before the cell has actually attained the length that it should have. And um, here you can see uh, such a divided cell where the cells are smaller than a normal cell would be at this stage. So the CDC2 uh, mutant uh, is one that we'll be talking about a lot. So the CDC2 mutant was studied and the gene defective in it was cloned by complementation. And of course, to start, study this further, once the gene has been cloned, you can predict its protein sequence and develop antibodies. And uh, using these tools, it was found that the CDC2 gene encodes a 34 kilodalton phosphoprotein, that is a protein uh, which is phosphorylated. And it was also observed um, in experiments where cells that were exponentially growing ultimately entered a stationary phase. And uh, it was observed that these the protein levels and phosphorylation do not change. Um, during uh, mitosis. So in the exponential phase, a lot of cells are in mitosis. And as the cells enter stationary phase, uh, the P34 protein seem to become dephosphorylated. And um, again, the state of phosphorylation uh, of P34 was correlating with a high mitotic index. That is, when you score the septated cells, that's an indicator of mitotic index. And when there were uh, more cells in mitosis, that's when you saw uh, more of the phosphorylation of P34. And when the cell ceased to divide, uh, the phosphorylation was not seen. Uh, and then it was also observed by biochemical experiments that the P34 protein had kinase activity. That is, it could itself phosphorylate other proteins. And the kinase activity was thermolabile in a CDC2 TS mutant. That is, this mutant was defective in the kinase activity of the protein, which is uh, encoded by this uh, defective mutant gene. To summarize the first part of the lectures on cell cycle regulation, um, the mitotic cell cycle has got G1, S, G2, and M phases, which occur in a sequential order. There is evidence for regulation of the cell cycle coming from cell fusion experiments and the experiments uh, related to maturation of Xenopus oocytes 
that were carried out that led to the discovery of MPF. It was found that S phase cell contents can induce G1 cells to enter S phase but cannot induce G2 cells. M phase extract can induce G2 cells to enter into M phase. In addition, mutants that were showing cell cycle arrest phenotypes, that is the cell division cycle mutants or CDC mutants, could be isolated from budding and fission yeast. And these mutants are potentially defective in genes encoding key cell cycle regulators. Stay tuned for part 2 of the lecture on cell cycle regulation.